Good afternoon. Um, uh, before we start uh, this afternoon's presentations, uh, I'd just like to um, pay my respects and acknowledge that uh, we uh, meet today uh, on Ghana country. We live, work and play on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and we respect their spiritual relationship with this country. We pay our respects to their leaders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that their language, cultural and traditional beliefs held for over 60,000 years is still as important and relevant to the living Ghana and all Aboriginal people today. Welcome colleagues. Um, it is a, a, a great honour to um, for me to introduce our speakers this afternoon, Associate Professors Daniel Hosted and, and Cynthia Papendick. I ask for your um, uh, patience with some of the tech I think it may be a bit of a wobbly afternoon. We've uh, been having some internet instability. Um, uh, this is an exciting phase in emergency medicine, which like my own um, discipline of intensive care medicine is a relatively young uh, discipline. So it's uh, really wonderful to see um, uh, early and mid-career researchers coming through and making their mark on the academic landscape. And uh, it really is great uh, to, to work with Daniel and Cynthia who have great energy and passion and commitment to the discipline. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll hand you over to Daniel. Uh, questions can be typed in the chat and then I'll put them to uh, the presenters at the end of the session as is the traditional format for this uh, quite packed and uh, um, very tight schedule. Uh, so um, with further, no further ado, introducing Daniel. Apologies if I cut in and out. The, the uh, hospital internet connection apparently is very low on bandwidth but keeps telling me so. Hopefully it works. Uh, essentially what I've chosen to have a chat about today is uh, something we've been doing in the ED for a few years now, which is emergency department blood psychoactive substance testing. Uh, it's essentially a collaborative thing between the Forensic Science SA and the major emergency departments in South Australia. In terms of why sort of illicit drugs are an issue, uh, one is mortality. So we know sort of that in young people, it's more illicit drug use leads to high mortality. So it's the second leading cause of death in those 25 to 44 and the third leading cause in those 15 to 24. And that's specifically for accidental poisoning. So it doesn't include sort of injuries related to, to illicit drugs or any unintentional or um, intentional overdoses, sorry. The other issue is in terms of emergency department presentations, we don't really know a lot about the sort of impact of illicit drugs. And that's due to a couple of things, one of which is we don't have a great way of coding emergency department visits. They're largely coded based upon symptoms, um, as in they'll be coded as agitation or behavioural disturbance, for example, rather than the drug themselves. Um, our best estimate comes from a small study in Western Australia, which came up with a rate of about 6.9% of all ED presentations being directly due to illicit drugs. Um, having said that, WA always seems to have slightly higher rates of drug and alcohol presentations than most of the rest of the country in the national sort of studies. So I suspect the numbers are slightly lower in South Australia. Coming back to the mortality sort of effects of illicit drugs, you can see from this, which tracks the cumulative mortality across uh, ages of the normal population, which is the all deaths. And from that, we see that 50% of all deaths occur after the age of 80 in Australia. Whereas you get basically a mirror image with illicit substance related deaths. So we get 50% of the drug related deaths happen before age 45 and 90% will occur before age 65. And your average death leads to a loss of life of approximately 35 years when it's substance related. So in Australia at the moment, most of our illicit drug monitoring, well, all of it essentially comes from outside the hospital setting. So the majority of it comes from user and community surveys. Um, and then there's some sort of smaller, usually sort of jurisdictional ones that include wastewater analysis, which is where you get the sort of newspaper headline saying meth capital of, of Australia, which I think pretty much every city has been called at one stage or another. Um, and then pill testing, which obviously gets a lot of media, but doesn't actually uh, constitute a very large amount of drug monitoring. While these are all interesting and give us some idea of, you know, how, what people are taking the community, they don't actually provide us with any information on what people are presenting to the hospital for in regards to illicit drugs, what drugs they're taking that lead them to present to hospital, 
or even where they're taking them. Uh, so like I said, most of the, our information from hospital at the moment is based upon either coding, which is fatally flawed, or estimates based upon ED clinicians' assumptions of what people have taken based upon how they present um, or what they've told them. So this study was essentially set up, initially it was a pilot study at the RA, and then it expanded to include the four major EDs in South Australia. And essentially what it does is takes anybody over the age of 18 who presents with illicit or suspected illicit drug intoxication, and provided they're going to either need a cannula or a blood sample, we take some more blood for essentially forensic analysis. Obviously, it's de-identified um, and involves a waiver of consent because this patient group is not particularly excited about us taking their, their blood. Um, it only, only happens if we're taking blood for another reason. So obviously, the data is skewed towards the higher complexity, higher acuity patients, you know, those who come in with a with a broken toe after they've been intoxicated, aren't gonna get blood. So we're not sort of capturing that data. Um, the blood then go to the forensic uh, SA who then do some fancy laboratory work and give us back some information on what drugs have been taken. In terms of what we found so far, so over about an 18 month period, there's been about 1200 patient enrollments, which we found 120 unique drugs um, the most common is methamphetamines at over 50%, um, which isn't all that surprising. What does surprise us, though, are the rates of GHB, which are 25%, and also some of the prescription drugs that seem to be diverted to uh, the illicit drug users, in particular pregabalin, which is sort of the, not really a restricted drug at all, and it seems to be the most diverted of the prescription drugs at the moment, almost one in 10 people coming in illicit drug intoxication uh, seem to have been using pregabalin. Um, the other sort of thing of interest was we're finding that it's actually very uncommon that people come in with just a single agent in the blood. The average we're finding is about three different drugs, uh, which obviously makes it very hard to, based on clinical findings, or what we presume the clinical findings to be, to sort of make any accurate guesses as to what people have taken. As I mentioned, GHB is particularly interesting to us. It's interesting because the sort of the national surveys where we, they come up with basically who's using what uh, estimates that only about 0.1% of the population use GHB in the last 12 months and that it hasn't changed at all in the last 15 years. Um, however, what we sort of found is like I showed you in the previous slide, about 25% of our presentations are GHB related. And we found quite a clear increase through time. So in the first month when we started, we were getting about 15% of the cases had GHB in the blood. And by the end of it, 18 months later, almost 50% of our presentations had GHB. And not only that, but the concentrations were also increasing. This is a bit of a concern for ED physicians because most of the drugs, the illicit drugs we see are somewhat restricted, whereas our GHB ones are less so. So generally people are not taking GHB, they're actually taking 1,4-butane dial, which has a sort of a, a weird quirk in that it's illegal to have it on you for personal intake, but it's not illegal to essentially import it and have it on you for uh, work-related reasons. And basically what it is, is a floor stripper. So they're often sold in those little sort of fishy soy packets. Um, soy sauce packets or little pipettes so you, you can go down highly and get sort of arrested for walking around with a little pipette of 1,4 butane dial yeah you can drive a truck with barrels and barrels of the stuff through the city and nobody bats an eyelid if you're supposedly using it to strip floors in terms of what we actually found people were presenting with we all expected now what we're going to see was a hell of a lot of agitation because it was going to largely be meth. And obviously you see headlines everywhere about the sort of the meth adult EDs. We actually found that more than 50% of the people coming in had CNS depression as their main presenting symptom. Um, and we're certainly not finding that the levels of things like methamphetamine actually sort of correlate with their symptoms. So some of the highest levels of methamphetamines recorded 
had people essentially com comatose and some of the very low levels had them extremely agitated. Um, and our suspicion is that is probably because most patients seem to be coming in with both a stimulant and a sedating agent on board. Uh, why exactly, presumably to balance it out, but how they balance it out, who knows. Uh, and in terms of where the people are coming from, obviously there's a lot of sort of media in regards to licensed venues and ticketed events and pill testing. What we find is the vast majority are not coming from there. Most of them are coming from the home or the public environment. Uh, so which is normally either a park or on the street. In particular, bus stops seem to be very, very popular for drug users. So uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what happens at bus stops, but we're getting a lot from bus stops. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention was our sort of disposition for this patient group. The vast majority of them go home. So about 75% of them go home either from the ED in under four hours or get admitted to our short stay unit. But of those that do get admitted, over half of them get admitted to the ICU or the HDU area. Um, and again, we're seeing an uh, GHB being disproportionately contributing to this compared to our other drugs. Uh, and that's the very, very quick brief summary. A little bit over eight minutes, but pretty close. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody is online has any questions. Uh, thanks, Dan. I'm just going to stay on mute to uh, preserve the uh, internet stability that left. Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. One here um, uh, about fentanyl. Uh, is there, uh, are you seeing any of that? That that, that obviously has become quite a, an issue overseas and in the media. We see a fair bit of opiates. We don't see a lot of fentanyl. We get, we've had occasional clusters in the past with the fentanyl. And one of the reasons this study was set up, like I said, my main interest is trying to work out what people are coming to ED with. Um, but obviously the toxicologist and the forensic guys interest is more in regards to what are the new drugs we're seeing um, and what are the sort of the clusters that we start seeing of acute intoxication that are weird. And a couple of those have been fentanyl derivatives, but yeah, we're certainly not seeing anywhere near the amount of, sort of opiate related presentations that, that we suspected. It's GHB seems to have really taken over. And another question is in relation to all of the drug screens that are done on uh, patients that come through the emergency department, are they part of this registry? They're off. Uh, we basically uh, don't do any drug screen. screens. We basically yes. don't do any drug screens on patients normally. So psychiatry <laughs> will sometimes do urine drug screens, which are you know notoriously inaccurate. Um, but from an ED perspective, it's very, very rare that we ever actually order illicit drug screens on people. Uh, and the ones that are ordered that you get from either the, the blood or the urine generally only have some very broad classes. So sort of, you know, six to eight drugs come, classes come back. So they don't get tested for all this, you know, the 1,500 different ones that get put through on this. So no, they're not included. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Dan. We're just coming up to 4.45. So I'll um, uh, hand over to Cynthia Papendick, who's also an associate professor with a particular interest in acute coronary syndromes. Over to you, Cynthia, and good luck. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jerry, for the introduction. And um, I think Kara is going to sh share my slides for me. Um, as Jerry mentioned, um, I have a particular interest in improving the safety, safety and efficacy of the investigation of our patients that present to the ED with suspected acute coronary syndromes. Next slide, please. And as you can imagine, um, chest pain in the emergency department represents a very, very large cohort of people and the differential diagnosis is huge. Sometimes it's super obvious, like this poor gentleman who has an arrow in his chest, um, but sometimes it's not so obvious. So our job in the ED is to sort of sort out what we think is going on and order the tests that are available to us to try and forward along the patient's treatment. Um, next, yeah, if you could go along, there's some, yeah. When ACS is suspected as a problem that is producing the chest pain, we use a system of risk stratification to try and determine the appropriate disposition from either sending the patient home 
to admitting the patient if they're super high risk. Often those two ends are the pretty easy bit. It's the middle bit, the basically the intermediate risk patients that are particularly difficult for us to sort out. And because risk assessment is based currently on some very poorly specific and subjective criteria, it requires quite a lot of finesse. And unfortunately, junior medical officers uh, don't have that finesse. And uh, as such, it ends up leading to a culture of over investigation. Next slide, please. And over investigation has a lot of problems with it. The first problem is that it's super expensive. So basically we are spending about $175,000 Australian to find one case of ACS from patients that we put down an ACS pathway. And that's because of the patients suspected, only about 8% to 10% will actually turn out to have ACS. We get a lot of negative testing. Next slide. But probably more importantly is this is really, really bad for patients. A system where we overtest and um, overburdens the health system with patients that are waiting for test results either in the ED or as an outpatient or admitted to hospital when they don't need to be admitted. So we're really working on strategies to try and get better about how we risk stratify and make this better for patients and for the health system. Next slide, please. Troponin, which is a chemical, um, a structural protein that's released from cardiac tissue when it's damaged, um, is basically the biomarker of choice for ACS risk assessment for the past few decades. And as such, it's it's really viewed as an objective metric in our ACS pathways. Um, and recently we have had more and more sen higher sensitivity assays introduced. And these are fantastic in the sense that they give us an improved negative predictive value. But unfortunately this comes at the cost of reduced specificity because as we get really, really precise at these tiny, tiny values, that's great for us to send patients home from the emergency department when they're low risk. But when we have these small values that are outside the reference range, it becomes very important that we interpret and determine what the cause of that cardiac injury is. It's not always a myocardial infarction. Next slide, please. Locally, we had an interesting thing happen. In 2011, all our machines at SA Pathology or at the time IMVS were replaced with a high sensitivity assay. This is in 2011. There were great concerns that we didn't know how to interpret the new assay. And so we were very afraid we were going to overtest test and, and cause harm. So a decision was made to hold the high sensitivity, sensitivity test results until we gathered more information. Next slide, please. There were some guidelines that were around, mostly from the European Society of Cardiology. These looked promising, but they were really based on pretty low quality evidence, mostly observational or retrospective trials. Next slide. So the decision was made at SA Health to mask the results. So this represents what we used to be able to get with the conventional assay, only reported down to 29 nanograms per liter. Next push button, please. The new high sensitivity assay would go all the way down to less than five, but because we didn't know what to do with these numbers, next slide please, we only showed the numbers down to 29 nanograms per liter. So we blinded clinicians to the complete result that might've been available to them. Next slide. We realized that this represented an opportunity for us to do a randomized control trial of which there was none at the time. Next slide, please. The key question we wanted the answer to was what the clinical impact on patient outcomes would be of having this higher performing assay incorporated into a rapid protocol. Next slide. Uh, I might go through these. Uh, basically, the outcomes were the primary outcomes were the 30 day incidence of death or MI, lots of secondary outcomes. Next slide. 
We published our methods um, in the American Heart Journal in 2017. You can look that up. I don't have the time to go through the methods in this brief uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Basically what we did was we randomized patients to either the high sensitivity one hour protocol or our standard protocol. We eliminated patients that were, or it, um, we did not include patients that were dialyzed or were being admitted to hospital for another reason or who had obvious STEMI or obvious ischemic, you know, changes on their ECG. Next slide. Next slide, please. We randomized 3,378 patients with uh, 1,600 in each group. Next slide. And getting right to the money, the primary endpoint was less than 1% evidence of MACE, which was basically MI because we had no deaths in either group, um, was less than 1% in both groups, the standard and the one hour protocol. Next slide, please. In terms of length of stay, there was somewhat of an improvement, not very dramatic. Standard protocol was 5.6 hours and the one hour protocol was 4.5 hours. Next slide. Discharge from ED though was really quite good. So the one hour protocol got 45% discharge whereas the standard was 33%. Next slide, please. This was published in circulation and we presented this data at the European, College of, uh, European Society of Cardiology in 2019 and the findings that we had were used in the 2020 ESC guideline as evidence for making a one hour pathway their preferred choice for ACS uh, workup. Next slide. Since the publication, we've now in South Australia unmasked these high sensitivity values and we have released a protocol we're using the figures that we found uh, for the interpretation of that protocol. We've done multiple audit cycles at Cal and focusing on examining patient safety primarily, but also resource utilization and accuracy of the new protocol. Next slide. We have published some late outcomes most recently in 2021 in circulation. Next slide. And we have a few upcoming things. We're going to do a review called Rapid Pace, which is looking at the outcomes for all of South Australia since we have released the um, high sensitivity values. So we're doing six, six months before and six months after. We also are looking at an AI project called Rapid X, and this is going to put in some computerized support to assist ED clinicians with ACS patient disposition. And locally, just at, at the raw ED, we're doing a trial called Shrewd ED, where we're trying to further refine our risk stratification by seeing if ED clinicians can order the CTCA, whether we can further refine that group and make sure that we're getting the right patients to see outpatients or cardiologists. Next slide, please. I'd just like to acknowledge that um, Rapid TNT, which is the trial I told you about, is the only randomized trial to date comparing a standard pathway with a rapid algorithm, and it's from little old South Australia, um, and that this project would not have been possible without a whole lot of collaboration between both individual clinicians across disciplines and across health networks, lots of support from emergency departments, cardiology departments, and SA pathology, and we also got financial support from NHMRC and from Roche Diagnostics, neither of which had any say on the reporting of our findings. Thanks so much for your attention. Uh, thanks so much, Cynthia, for that uh, rapid review. Um, we just have a, we do have a minute or two, so I just wondered whether or not you might be able to tell us about some of the results from uh, some of those later studies, that long-term follow-up in particular. Yeah, so there's some interesting uh, signals coming out of there. One of them is that we are doing more invasive imaging in uh, the groups that have high sensitivity values. So it's taking a period of adjustment for, I think, uh, emergency physicians, but also cardiologists to learn how to interpret these figures and to 
uh, be able to interpret whether a troponin rise, for lack of a better word, really represents a, a, a type one or a type two MI and, and what exactly the next steps are. There's a lot of evidence to show that any rise in troponin is not good for us, but we're increasingly learning that there are multiple etiologies that are causing this rise. So it really remains to be seen the best next steps as to how to act on an altered level. And I have a follow-up question, which is th there's been a lot in the um, medical literature in relation to gender differences um, in terms of diagnosis and outcomes for, uh, you know, for acute coronary syndromes. And have you, uh, has your work contributed to this uh, better understanding of uh, AM, MI and ACS in, in women? Um, I haven't looked at that specifically, however, what we have done is when we calculated the values we were going to use to determine our cutoffs, we used rather than, as I mentioned, the, the risk stratification is getting more and more complicated. One of the choices that we made because women's troponin levels are generally less than a man's. And as a result, um, you need to have separate levels um, for each, you know, gender specific levels or sex specific levels, we made a decision to skew the whole, the whole group downward to make sure we incorporated women. But as such, we've now gone a bit too sensitive and we may need to start to portion that out and have sex be an actual part of an ACS, you know, pathway risk management. So it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, I'm just uh, checking whether any more questions have come through. And uh, uh, well, just a congratulations, really. I mean, it, that's some uh, uh, very impressive publications in circulation um, uh, there. So um, uh, has it made any difference to kind of the, the practice uh, across the country? Has it been picked up and uh, by, by emergency physicians um, and cardiology colleagues nationally? Yeah, I think somewhat it has. Some of our colleagues, for example, in Queensland um, or in New South Wales and Victoria are already using um, a higher sensitivity assay. I think we were all sort of floating a bit blind as to how to interpret our numbers. And in fact, we still are working things out in terms of really accurately you know, being able to interpret what these values mean. Um, so I hope that our work is making a difference for our, you know, our colleagues interstate, but I think some of us have already mo moved forward. It made a big difference for SA where we basically were not moving forward with um, our ability to see the high sensitivity values until very recently. Well, look, okay. all that remains is for me to thank you both. I mean, these are really important uh, clinical areas to our broader community um, uh, uh, and certainly has a huge impact uh, on the emergency um, presentations to our hospitals. Uh, so um, we look forward to seeing how this work develops in the future. Thank you both. Thanks for the opportunity.